Well, maybe you've had this thought. You know, I realize God's forgiven my sin, but I just can't get over my past. We're going to talk about that on today's edition of Life Questions. My name is Jeff Milslegel, sitting in for Bill Harris. And of course, I've got four local pastors here beside me. We're going to talk about that and some other subjects today. Pastor uh, Dave Burkhart from United Methodist Church. Also, Rich Reiki, the Director of International Ministries, Teens for Christ. Jason Goss from the Wapak Church. And finally, Pastor Neil Whitney, the Church at Allentown. So before we get into that question, gentlemen, I'm going to throw out an easy one here for you. Uh, a lot of people choose the new year to start a new Bible reading plan. Do you have recommendations to follow? How do people get started on this? Pastor Whitney, I'm going to open up with you. What do, what do you tell people who want to do this? Well, we have a great devotional at our church that we furnish every month. And the back of that devotional has a Bible reading plan. Yeah. And you can find Bible reading plans in the backs of many Bibles. So uh, there's just a myriad of uh, Bible reading plans out there. And any one you start will be better than the one that you didn't do last year. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of true. Just get into something. So uh, what, other, what other things can you guys recommend? Well, we usually recommend, especially if someone's new uh, to being a Christian and walking with Jesus, uh, read one proverb a day. Ah. There's 31 proverbs, so that will get you one a day. And just repeat that over several months. Mm -hmm. uh, one proverb a day. Proverbs is all about wisdom. You want to become wise? Read something that's going to make you wise. And then if you want to add on to that, read the Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Because if we could get Jesus right, you'd be ahead of most people. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. So read Proverbs, read the Gospel. I, I, I love your input about Proverbs because I think that's so true. It's easy to read. It's not complicated. And it's just straightforward, but has gobs of wisdom in there. Gentlemen? Yeah, I would, I would just say, similar to what Neil said, anything that you'll keep doing, do. Make sure that you're not just reading a devotional um, and regurgitating somebody else's thoughts, but that you're connecting to the Word itself. So, that you know, there's some great classic ones out there, Streams in the Desert, Jesus Calling. Um, uh, there's daily devotionals, The Daily Bread, The Upper Room but they all have Bible reading plans related to them to get you into the Word. If you commit to reading a chapter a day, working through the New Testament, something to start, um, I think anything that gets you in the Word mm. is fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I've the one thing that I would recommend to people is to take that King James Bible, which is beloved by so many people, and it is a wonderful translation, and, and stick it on the shelf until you have the opportunity to read some other versions. Mm, yes. Uh, I, I like some of the different translations. I use the Holman Christian Standard myself. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, it's, a, it's just a lot easier to read and understand. The second thing I'd like people to know is if, if you don't understand the Bible, don't worry about it. The more you read, the more you'll understand. Right. I read through it twice before I began to understand uh, a lot of the things that I didn't understand before. Sure. Yeah. Um, and also, there are, are great um, Bible reading tools out there like study Bibles. Uh, I would never uh, tell somebody just read the Bible and, and understand it without uh, study tools to go along with it. I mean, my goodness, my shelves are full of commentaries and, and all kinds of different stuff. Hmm. And so, you know, get into all those things. Uh, again, I, I would probably recommend New Testament start, the Gospels, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and because then when you go back and read the Old Testament, it really makes more sense because... Because yeah, you're looking at it through New Testament eyes. You yeah. are, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. It's... You know, you've got at least a foundation there. Yeah, yes. So, yes. yeah, okay. really important. I didn't let you jump in there. Well, I, I think what's important is, is re read whatever version you can memorize. Okay, the, if the goal is to hide God's word in your heart, you know, if you can memorize a certain version and that finds easier, read it. Yeah. They're, all, they're all taken from the original. Some are word for word translations, some are thought for thought, but read the one that helps you. Mm -hmm. uh, memorize that the best. That's it, the, it's, 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 I always say Bible study is kind of like taking a walk. I have never come back from a walk and said, boy, that was a waste of 40 minutes. That was a waste of time. I've never done that. And I've never done that with Bible study. Right. Time invested in God's word is always good. All right, let me move on to this next question here. It's kind of a, kind of a deeper one here. It says, I, Before we go yeah, to that, go can I share just one more thing? Yeah. Uh, there's a new little booklet out. Um, it's called 
a plus nothing gospels. And um, there, there's a greatest little books. Um, it, it's the gospels in chronological order and they're absolutely free. All you have to do is go to plusnothing.com or is it org? Uh, one of the two, mm -hmm. type them into your search engine. It'll come up, they're absolutely free. They'll send it to you. If you wanna make a donation to the organization, they'll take it. But it's just a great way to start reading the Bible because it, it tells you about the life of Jesus in chronological order, and it, they're just really incredible. Point is, we we want to encourage people to get in the Word. Absolutely, we got to do this. All right, okay. So uh, let me uh, go to this one here about forgiveness. It's kind of a big one. It says, "I know God forgives people and has forgiven me, but I am struggling to overcome shame from a decision I made 30 years ago." So it's not something that happened last month or last week. We're talking decades ago. How do I get past this? I keep telling myself that God has forgiven me, but I can't get past the situation. What would you say to this person? Bottom line is, is they're not being willing to forgive themselves. Mm. And when you decide not to forgive yourself and God has, that's a dangerous place to be because you're actually placing yourself above God. Mm. So I need to start respecting God a little bit more and uh, focus more on the future and not the past. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There's a town you can live in. It's kind of an imaginary town, but it's called Regretsville. And if you decided to live in Regretsville, you can live there the rest of your life. Mm, but be... if you decide to live for the future, live for Jesus, then uh, that kind of goes away. I've made so many mistakes in my past. If I focused on them, I wouldn't be able to do anything for God. Yeah. I just can't. You can't do that. So you just have to look forward. That's, they say when, you, when they teach you to, I drove semi a lot, and they teach you to look in the rear view mirror 10% of the time. And that's not a bad idea for walking through life. Mm. Is Yeah, you look back to make sure you don't make the same mistake twice. Yep. But the rest of the time you need to keep focused on the future. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I'd say uh, piggybacking on what Neil said, godly guilt drives us to confession and repentance. Oh, yeah. God, godly guilt is healthy. It, mm -hmm. The sin that we committed draws us to Him, draws us for a need to, for a Savior, but you know, ungodly guilt drives us to shame and drives us to a lack of fruitfulness for the kingdom. And uh, I would say to try to break that, I would go to Scripture, Colossians 1, starting at verse 11, May you be strengthened with all power mm. according to His glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So this is the Word. The Word says if we've confessed it, we're forgiven. And I think when we turn it back, so if you can say out loud, Father, I thank you that you have forgiven me of this. There's something about that where we break the strongholds that the enemy wants to keep us chained mm. to the guilt of the past. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I'm no longer embarrassed by my past. Now my past is a testimony on how, what God's brought me through. Mm -hmm. this, and, and that's part of that growing process. Don't be ashamed of it. Say, I admit it. It happened. And now God's changed me. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to be ashamed of it. I'm now going to embrace what God is doing now in my life. Mm -hmm. But look, go ahead. One of my mentor pastors uh, once told me that if, if we harbor unforgiveness in our heart, it's like drinking a cup of poison and waiting for the person that we don't forgive <laughs> to die. Yeah. And, and I think if we have trouble forgiving ourselves, um, it, it's the same thing. Uh, only Satan gets the victory over that. And mm -hmm. so we just, you know, we have to learn to do that. I, I mean, let's face it, there's not a single person here that doesn't have regrets about what we've done in the past. Um, but when Satan keeps bringing that up in our mind, we just have to keep saying, uh, get away from me, Satan. Yes. I used to say, get behind me, Satan, but I don't do that anymore because I don't even want him following me. <laughs> I want him out of there. It's so. easier to stab you in the back when he's yeah, That's right. <laughs> But I would say, too, it doesn't say it in the question, but for whatever reason, this popped in my mind. I'm wondering if this thing isn't still a secret. 
and oh, I don't know man. if it is or not, but I would encourage them, if they've never shared it with somebody, to confess it to another brother or sister. Maybe, there maybe, may be something they need to make right with another yeah. individual, and even though it's been years. There may be something that they're, they've asked for forgiveness, but they've not tried to reconcile. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have. I don't know. James talks about that's healthy. It's, it's healthy, yeah. yeah. So confess to one another, not right. because I need that person to absolve my sins, but it's the idea of when another person still loves me, even though they know my junk, it's, it reminds me of God's love for me in the right. midst of my struggle. Mm, yeah, yeah. Just find that person that's trustworthy, though. You don't want somebody that's going to go around and gossip <laughs> yeah, about absolutely. it. Well, that's true, yeah. too. So, yeah. Uh, okay, that kind of leads us to the next question here. It's kind of somewhat tied to that. How can I really know I have the security of heaven? How can I really know this? We're talking about forgiveness, and we have this scriptures. You don't forget somebody, you know. <laughs> Anyhow, it gets, it gets all complicated with this. But how do we really know we have security of heaven? When so it comes to forgiveness. I'll, I would say, does God keep his word? And if you could say, yes, God, is God truthful and honest? Is God a person of integrity? Yes. So God says, if you've asked for forgiveness, if you've admitted you made mistakes and sinned, and you've asked for forgiveness, he forgives you. And so then, if God's forgiven you, then heaven is your destination. And so there's nothing more I have to worry about there. Mm. So it's sometimes we question maybe, did God really forgive me? but then you're questioning the character of God. Mm -hmm. And is the character of God faithful and true? Yes. So that, 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 this question kind of can be read a couple different ways. Yes. I know we, t we talked about that before. Yeah, I, I, I didn't like the question because I thought maybe they were coming from a, a, the wrong place. How can I be assured of my security of heaven? You're missing the whole point. I, I know what Rich Reiki deserves. If, if the Lord tomorrow sends me to the deepest, darkest dungeon of the deepest pit of hell, that's what I deserve, and I'm going to serve him now, even if that's my destiny. Mm. Now, he promises me it's not, that I get to share in the riches of heaven, and that's great, but, but I know what I deserve. Anything else is icing on the cake, but the ultimate thing is my relationship with the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think you have to focus there, that this is about your relationship with the Lord. And if you're nurturing your relationship with the Lord, you don't have to worry about the security of heaven. Mm, yeah, yes, yeah, that's true. So how, how do we nurture, or kind of beg to me, it would lead to the next step. How do we nurture our relationship with the Lord? How, how, how do we? <laughs> it, it, I think it goes back to how do, you, how do you nurture the relationship with your wife or with your spouse? You spend time with them. Yeah. You talk with them. You communicate with them. Um, I can't just, you know, say once a week. If once a week I went and said, hey, babe, I love you, um, she probably is not going to believe me. And I think some people, if we're, if we're in that habit sometimes, the only time I talk to God is when I go to church on Sunday. Mm, yeah. It's got to be that relationship. It's got to be, and a relationship takes time. And kind of, kind of how we're getting here is that if that relationship's developed, I have assurances of, of heaven. And so these things that I've done in the past that I'm letting bother me really shouldn't be anymore because I've got to be resting in the forgiveness that God's given me that allows me to be to heaven, et cetera, et cetera, and having a walk worthy of the Lord, et cetera. We could go on and on with this. We're going to take a brief break, and then we'll come back. We're going to tackle another issue here on Life Questions. Don't go away. There's still a lot more discussion to come on this episode of Life Questions. But first, do you have a question for a future show? Email it to lifequestions at WTLW.com or call us 419-339-4444. You can also suggest pastures you feel would be a good fit for our panel. Again, send your question ideas and pastor suggestions to lifequestions at WTLW.com. Now back to the discussion. And welcome back once again to Life Questions. So we're going to continue on in this idea talking about forgiveness. So gentlemen in the Bible, Jesus says to forgive someone 70 times, seven times. That is hard. A family member has been cruel to me many times for many years and I keep forgiving, but I've noticed I have a lot of deep hurt on this. When can I just cut off ties with this person and move on? What do you think about that one? Number one thing from the recovery world is there's no excuse for abuse. Ah, yes. Elaborate on that. You just, you shouldn't allow yourself to be hurt over and over and over. Okay, so you're saying in this situation, this person probably should at least put themselves into some protected position. Yeah, way past time. 
Yeah. Way past time. Well, and uh, related to that, though, forgiveness does not always equate reconciliation. Correct. Absolutely. So I can forgive this person, meaning I can not hold their past against them. But what I tell couples, especially when they're going through marital strife or something as egregious as infidelity or something, is if you want the person to forget that, then you also have to forget all the good stuff. So the relationship begins anew and you start rebuilding trust. Mm. Right. And with any person, the question is, is this a person that I want to rebuild trust with? And do I want to put time and effort and energy into doing that? Forgiveness is one issue. Reconciliation or building a relationship is a separate issue. Boy, isn't it though. And yeah. we would always tell people that hurting people hurt people. Mm -hmm. So if, if someone's hurting you, what's the real issue? Is there mm -hmm. another issue at play? And can, do you recognize that? And, you know, hey, I can't fix it. I can't solve it. So I'm, I'm going to remove myself from that situation. Or I'm going to recognize the reason they're lashing out at me is really another issue. I'm not going to take it personal. I'm going to move on. So just to be clear, we're, we're, we're not saying these things are necessarily linked together. We're actually saying forgiveness is, is different than the idea of forcing yourself to be Forgiving and forgetting are different. Uh, diff okay, Forgiveness yes. and trust is different. So mm -hmm. you have to, those are not exclusive to one mm -hmm. another. And, and I do think a lot of people get this all jumbled up and feel like they need to stay in a whatever situation where, where they're just being abused like that. God How did you say that again? Well, my new thought on that is, is forgiving somebody doesn't make them right, but that sets you free. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, yes. And, yeah. a, and a great book on that, Dr. Henry Cloud has a book called Boundaries. Right. And if oh, the yeah. person is wrestling with that, I just strongly encourage them to get that book and read it. For anybody struggling with other people infringing and how do you say, how do you set healthy boundaries in any relationship without being offensive? He's got one on dealing with toxic people too. Yeah. Same, same ah, idea. Okay. So God can forgive and forget, but we can't. Yeah, yes. So, so. so we have to live in this world and... Uh, Move on, I guess, as Fowler's saying. All right, anything else on that before I move on? So, all right, okay, so let's try to tackle this one. It says, I raised my children in the knowledge of the Lord. Because we can kind of debate exactly what that means there, but that's what they're saying. I have watched them choose, I've watched them choose worldly passions, and now I'm concerned about my grandchildren. Do you have any suggestions on how I can be a witness without making it, making it overly obvious? My children don't like it when I boldly talk about Jesus to my grandchildren. It sounds like a bit of a family struggle going on here. Well, it sort of depends on what he means, he or she means by boldly talking to their grandchildren about Jesus. Ah. And, uh, I, you know, I think there's, there's subtle ways that can be very bold. Um, we've done that with our grandchildren quite a little bit where um, we can share Jesus uh, through great stories. And, you know, when kids are young, they love to listen to stories. They do, yeah. And, and those Bible stories are absolutely amazing. Uh, once the kids get a little older, then it's time to change stories a little bit mm. and, uh, and move on to the stories of Jesus and tell them, tell them those things as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, there, and, there's... And maybe along that line, I would say stop preaching and start living. Yeah. yeah. So, it, it, you know, so many times we, we want them to believe all the right things, so we're preaching at people. But if you're just living consistently your faith, mm. if you're modeling prayer, if you're modeling taking time for devotions, if you're modeling a healthy attitude of way of treating people in the checkout line at the grocery store, if you're modeling healthy living in traffic when you want to fly the bird and you decide to do something else, if you're modeling Jesus in those moments that'll be infectious mm. to your grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And part of that goes with don't undermine, undermine mom and dad. Cause yeah, that, so that, work that out so, and that might be a conversation you need to have with your kids is listen, hey, I'm, I, you know who I am, you know how I raised you, and this is what I believe. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna shy away with it, I'm not gonna be overly preachy, but I'm also not gonna undermine you and make you look bad in front of, in front of your kids. Mm. So honest conversation is, is really the best way to have that. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I can imagine though this is a little, harder mm -hmm. to do in reality than just us talking about it. So what are some practical ways that we can really do this? I know you're talking about modeling Christianity, but how, how, I mean, how do we do this when, 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 our, when our kids have, as they've shown here, cho have chosen worldly passions? So how, how, how do we do this, a relationship with our kids? And then we see the subsequent generation, I guess we're just standing back looking at this and being woefully concerned about the future. What, what do we deal with? How do we approach this? 
Don't the let best, me hang in here, guys. <laughs> uh, the best, uh, for me, there's a variety of ways to be in contact with, with your grandchildren and even your children. Uh, we mail our daily devotional to our children. Every month. Oh, you email. Oh, okay. No, That's a good we idea. snail mail. It's a book, so. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Quarterly, I send them that daily devotional, and uh, so do they all read it all the time? I actually don't know. Some of them do, but it's all about planting seeds. Yeah. It's all about yeah. planting seeds, and planting seeds in a way that's not offensive. And when you have your own children, you care for them. They get a little bit older, you coach them, and then when they get away from you, you're their consultant. That's good, yeah. And, yeah. and the consultant needs to uh, keep themselves on top of things. Yeah. Mm. And, and we need to be seeking God with all of our heart and soul about our children and grandchildren. Mm -hmm. My wife and I are, you know, that's what we do. And it's not easy. And you want to see instant results and all the desires we have for our kids and our grandkids and now our great grandkids. Mm. But stay in touch. My wife is way better than I am. Uh, she stays in touch. Mm. She stays in touch. She's connected. And uh, because of that, they know that she cares. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. All right. All right. Anybody else got anything else? We're going to no. jump to this next one. Okay. So, uh, no, I, I know, Pastor, you really wanted to do this question. So, oh, yeah. okay. So, we're going to. So <laughs> okay. Okay. Our, our church got a new pastor at the start of the year. He's making a lot of changes that don't sit well with me. How long do I give this new pastor a chance, or is it okay for me to change churches? I don't like what he's doing. I'm going to change churches. What do you answer? How do you answer this one? No, don't change church. <laughs> <laughs> the, or, or do the pastor a favor or, and leave. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think the biggest thing you need to know is you need to get to know the pastor's heart. Ah, uh, yeah. Why are the changes being made? Is it, are they being made because he's trying to make the church more relevant to the culture you live in? Is he trying to reach more families? Is he doing it because he, he senses there's a direction God is taking your church? The problem is a lot of times we don't like change. Mm, mm -hmm. So don't come in and, and we all joke beforehand because we all had to, you know, well, let's argue about the color of the carpet. And it's sad that that's a joke because th that has become a bigger issue than the gospel. I, I want to reach people. Yeah. And if I think that God's telling me to reach people in a certain way, uh, I want to do that, but then are the people who were sitting in the pews or in the congregation going, well, that's not how we've done it in the past. Well, if that's not how you've done it in the past, it's also probably the reason why you're not growing mm. or you're not doing anything. I think we all can agree that church in the future is going to be different. I don't think society is going back the way it was. Mm. So that means we have to do new things. Does that mean I'm, I, I like everything I have to do as a pastor? No, I can tell you there are some things I have to do as a pastor I'm not, I'm not a fan of, but it's what we need to do to reach people. So how, how does somebody uh, that's in this situation and they, you know, they have their church or new pastor has now started and they're not happy with things. What, what would you like that if you were the pastor in that situation, what would you like somebody to do? Well, I, I think the first thing is you have to ask yourself as the person who's offended, is there something going on that's unbiblical? Yeah. Meaning is there false teaching? If there is, then you need to leave, mm -hmm. right? If, if there's, are there ways of treating people that aren't being addressed? You know, is it a dictatorial leadership style or, or mm. is there something going on that maybe a conversation needs to be had? But I think what Jason said about getting to know the pastor's heart, you know, what, why are these changes? Just because we're communicators of the gospel doesn't necessarily mean we're the best communicators of process. Everything happens in our uh. minds. And so sometimes it's just a lack of communication. We imply a motive or a false a narrative where there isn't one, oh, he's just trying to get after this person or he's trying to steal authority from this person or whatever. So I, I think you have to ask that question. And, and I would also say, what's your attachment to the body? Mm. The pastor isn't just the pastor. Are you invested in that body? This is, these are supposed to be your people. Mm -hmm, this mm -hmm. is supposed to be your community of faith. This is where you've committed in every church that I've been a part of. These are the people that I've committed through baptism and, and membership or affiliation, that th this is the tribe that I've chosen to demonstrate Christ to the world with. Mm -hmm. And, and if, if your mindset shifts, it's not, church isn't about my comfort. Yeah. It's about me connecting uh, to the gospel and c taking the gospel to the world. So uh, yeah. I, I, would, I would really ask this person, you know, if you want a better pastor, 
pray for the one you have. Ah, yeah. okay. So I'm sure you guys have all had to handle conflict, right? Oh, in yeah. your church, okay. So give me a story. How did you handle it? I always tell people to be patient because the Bible says love is patient, love is kind. Yeah, yeah. Love is not jealous, love is not boastful, it's not arrogant, it's not rude. You can go through that whole thing. Yeah, it, which is kind of fun, by the way. We, we tend to limit that 1 Corinthians 13 passage to marriage. Oh, right. But it obviously <laughs> has a really... lot more to, yeah, yeah right. so yeah. yeah. So I tell people to be patient. Number one thing I tell people is, is that tradition is fine as long as it's not holding you back. So you need to take a hard look at what the conflict issue is. Mm -hmm. And if it's tradition and it is holding you back, then you may need to let go of it. Mm -hmm. Like you say, and church is not like it used to be. And the be. hard part is, is if he's a new pastor, he may not know the church's tradition unless right. somebody tells him. So you've got to communicate. Hey, what, right. what's been your tradition in the past? I didn't know. Right. Go to your pastor and talk to him. Mm -hmm. I think that's probably one of the biggest things. Go and talk to him, but, but, um, but go with a heart of compassion. And, and make sure that it doesn't become uh, a, an argument in the process. Mm. Um, stay calm. Um, gosh, if you're contemplating leaving anyway, stay calm, find out what the issues are. Uh, but first and foremost, like Rich said, um, you definitely wanna make sure that, that your pastor is preaching biblically. And maybe there's been pastors in the past that haven't, that have, uh, preach to the wants and the needs, or not the needs, but the wants and desires mm -hmm. of the people in the church. And, and this pastor recognizes it and needs to make some changes. If that's the case, they're going to be able to explain that to you. And so stay calm, listen, mm -hmm. see what's going on. Well, and I think setting up a meeting where, hey, this isn't about winners and losers. Right. It's not about you getting your way or me getting my way. Right. It's about pastor these changes are being made and this is how it makes me feel that I'm upset. I, I don't know why. I think that opens up relationship. And if mm -hmm. you have a relationship, you, you may find out that person receives it well. They may not, but at least you're approaching it from a healthy Christian perspective. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes as a pastor, we make changes too quickly. We see a need or we see something. We, I got to fix uh. this now. And sometimes it's hard for us to go, I need to pull back the reins because I really need to involve people in the conversation. I need to help them see why this needed. So yeah. sometimes that's hard for, for us to see. Mm -hmm. Well, and not only that, but if a pastor's got a, a very strong leadership type um, personality, yeah. oftentimes they don't realize what a, a heartache they're causing with a lot of people in the yeah. congregation. It's the opportunity to share. Look, do you realize what you're doing? Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. That's when they may need to look to the church board or pastor parish committee or whatever you have in your church mm -hmm. is so, elders. But it, it sounds like what you all were saying is communication is a big deal. You'd probably Huge. all rather have someone come to you directly, come to you directly and say, hey, I'm having an issue with this. Or, Pastor, why are you doing it? We love the way the old thing was and you're changing it. Why? You'd probably all love to have that. I, so The biggest thing is I can't fix a problem unless I know it exists. You know about it, yeah. So you got to tell me. Uh, once again, I'd love to just continue this more, but we are fresh out of time here on Life Questions. Thanks so much for uh, spending your uh, half hour here with us. We really appreciate it. And we'll see you next time on Life Questions. You've been watching TV44's newest locally produced program, Life Questions. Now we'd like your feedback. What did you enjoy about this show and what would you like to see more? Perhaps you have your own questions you'd like us to pose to our panel of pastors in a future show. Submit your questions now by email to lifequestions at wtlw.com or call us with your thoughts. We are able to discuss relevant topics with local pastors right here in the TV44 studio thanks to your financial support. Now is an excellent time to make a one-time gift to TV44 or consider becoming a monthly donor. 100% of your donation stays right here at TV44 and is used to spread the family-friendly, life-changing message of Jesus Christ. Secure donations can be made online at WTLW.com, by phone, by mail, or in person. Again, share your questions for consideration for future shows or just contact us with your comments at lifequestions at WTLW.com.